thank you for taking the time to come here today. Because when diverse communities like ours, they intermingle in a meaningful way. We learn to appreciate each other more. I'm sure you can all appreciate things like the intricate carvings of our temple that you can see, or the traditional clothes that we're wearing today, and as many people do. But more than simply admiring it, I hope you try to start understanding it. Hindu-Americans, not just here in South Florida, but across the nation, are a thriving and growing community. Not only do Hindu-Americans hail from all over the world, be it India, Africa, the Caribbean, or Europe, we also need our homes in all parts of this country. Yes, we're your doctors, lawyers, and engineers, but we're also your business owners, we're your teachers, and we're your neighbors. This only goes to show that some of the core values we share with this nation, unity and diversity, and hard work. Sharing so many fundamental beliefs has allowed us to weave our own Hindu colors into the fabric of this nation. And we proudly call this country our own. But we are not free from the challenges other minorities face in this country. While we appreciate it when people enjoy wearing bindis for concerts, practicing yoga, and wearing clothes with the images of our deities or at home, there is a lack of understanding Sometimes, the respect that should go along with it is lost in translation. Be it our clothes, traditions, rituals, or symbols, we've often seen ourselves misrepresented and misunderstood in our schools, by prominent individuals, and all over in the media. As we move forward with your help, we hope to create a safer and brighter future for all Hindu Americans by bringing that understanding in our community. So today, let's take a first step towards creating that understanding together. So with that, I'd like to invite our Honorable Wendigi and our youth volunteers to open us up with some opening prayers. Thank you, and all of our wonderful volunteers. Uh, I hope you got a little taste of what we're all about. 
Mr. Narendra Maheshwari and Mr. Narendra Singh, who will take a moment to tell you about the South Florida Hindu Temple. So please, if you would like.
नमस्कार एवरीवन हिंदू अमेरिकन पॉलिटिकल एक्शन कमिटी ऑफ फ्लोरिडा इज एन इंडिपेंडेंट नॉन पॉलिटिशियन पॉलिटिकल एक्शन कमिटी फॉर द हिंदू अमेरिकन कम्युनिटी ऑफ फ्लोरिडा दिजन ऑफ हिंदू अमेरिकन पॉलिटिकल एक्शन कमिटी ऑफ फ्लोरिडा इज एंगेजिंग एंड एजुकेटिंग द कम्युनिटी विद सोशियो पोलिटिकल कॉजेस एंड लोकल गवर्नमेंट इनिशिएटिव country the world the united states hapac hindu american political action committee florida mission is to identify and support candidates who prioritize and are committed to religious freedom civil and human rights and other hindu american interests what does hindu american political action committee want to do campaign and fight for religious and civil rights of hindu americans present accurate history of hindu civilization in schools correct misrepresentations of hindu dharma in media ensure that the religious freedom and human rights of hindus in other parts of the world are a priority in the formulation of us foreign policy on par with trade security and other strategic interests promote other policies impacting the broader interests of hindu americans cultivate and support the next generation of hindu american policy makers thank you namaste This is truly about our community understanding the rich history of our very, very glorious civilization. So I'm going to try my best to condense almost uh, 12,000 plus years of documented history in about 20 minutes if I can. So please forgive me if I, if I try to rush through this. Okay, first and foremost, I'm a physician. There's a big culture in medicine about plagiarism. Uh, you know, stealing ideas and stuff like that. So I never ever want to present anything without giving due credit. So I have a whole host of gurus in my life that I revere greatly. These are my professors in colleges, medical school, my parents, my wife, my kids, everybody is a guru at the end of the day because they teach you something. And of course, scholars and intellectuals that I put there, there are too many to read, but I just want to make sure I acknowledge all of them. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, if you, I grew up in India. And, you know, it was part of me, my life, to embrace our civilization because I grew up there. It's, it's everywhere. But when I came to the United States, I was a little bit confused because of my background. One of which is, I first saw equality and liberty for all. But in our culture, it's always truth is the main starting place and the ending place because that's gonna, that is going to liberate everything and everybody. So there's a difference. In, in, in the thinking right from the get-go. So we speak about Satya Meva Jayate, which essentially means truth alone triumphs, all right? The always, uh, the cause of a Hindu American pact, you know, we are going to uh, take up is going to be to set the truth free because there's a lot of misrepresentation happening in the United States and across the world about our culture and our civilization. And 
traditionally we've been somewhat quiet about it, but right now we feel the need to make sure that we set the record straight and set the truth free. And our entire civilizational goal is something called sat essentially sat, sat means truth, chit means some higher consciousness beyond the mind, anand means joyfulness or blissfulness. So our entire existence is about that, sat chit anand. Okay, I'd like you to remember that if you can. And our culture is really called Sanatana Dharma. Okay, Hinduism is a recent terminology. Isms of all types are really impositions of the globalization movement. There is no ism. Our real uh, culture is about what we call Sanatana Dharma. Sanatana means eternal. Dharma is our duty. Another interesting thing I want to make sure that everybody understands is that I was confused as a young adult when I came to the United States because it was all about rights. It's about my right, my this, my that. It's all individual rights. But in our culture, it's a strange concept because there are no rights without duty. There is no rights anybody deserves without the duty that they, that they should manifest it uh, in the community. In, you know, so we have to see where do I fit in in the global picture where do I fit in in my community? Where do I fit in in the cosmic picture? What is my contribution to that? And that is my dharma. That is my duty. Essentially, that's where everything starts and ends, okay? It is not really about rights. That's not what we fight for because if you focus on the truth and your duty, rights naturally flow through that. That is the concept of, of our culture. So many of you probably know a little bit about the Hindu community or India at large. Many of you probably associate this with curry, cows, and caste. That's pretty much what everybody thinks about. But this is an extraordinarily naive misrepresentation of our very, very ancient culture. Like I said, 12,000 plus years of documented history. So it could be even longer than that. We just don't know. So another thing that I always uh, you know, come about is that you know, there's a British invasion. There's a lot of British influence. There's a lot of Mughal influence but that only covers a very, very short uh, time period in our culture. So I'm gonna try to take you guys back a little bit to give you a, a tour of this. And you know, as, as, as we talked about, many of you probably associate many Indians as nerds or geeks because many of us are doctors, I'm one. Uh, we have engineers, we're computer scientists, and recently you may have seen in the news many of the technology CEOs are from Indian origin. Some of them are Hindu, some of them may not be but that's what America generally knows about India. So let me tell you the full story. Let me tell you what I can in 20 minutes about what we, at least me, uh, uh, it, it means to me. Because you know, while I'm no expert in Hinduism uh, or Sanatana Dharma, because the freedom and the flexibility that our culture gives us is immense because it's always about self realization, self-experience. So of all of the varied experiences I've had, this is my interpretation of it, and somebody else may have a different one, but that's okay, that's the beauty of our culture. So there's a famous uh, a historian named Will Durant, okay? He wrote a magnum opus collection of, of his work called The History of Civilizations. You can see it's a series of books. He spent his entire lifetime writing about it, all right? And this is his quote. He says, India was the motherland of our race, and Sanskrit the mother of Europe's languages. She was the mother of our philosophy, mother through the Arabs of much of our mathematics, mother through the Buddha of the ideals embodied in Christianity, mother through the village community of self-government and democracy. Mother India is in many ways the mother of us all. That's because this is, like we've heard, the only real science experiment happening in, 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 in the world because this is the oldest civilization that's been going through all types of natural evolution and it still survives today. And for that, we owe it an obligation to make sure it's preserved for the future. I was going to play uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, video and audio for you guys, but because of the interest of time, I'm gonna skip through this, but I do wanna speak about it. There is a, there is a, a uh, body of literature called the Vedas. I'm, some, I'm sure some of you have heard about it. Uh, the first book of that is called the Rig Veda. And in the Rig Veda, there's a suktam called the Nasadiya Sukta. So now I'm gonna take you back in time to introduce to you 
the time, the concept of time in our culture. And basically what Nasadiya Sukta says, which unfortunately uh, I probably can't play, is that, you know, for some faiths, time uh, starts at a certain historical time period, whenever that is. But in our Sanatana Dharma culture, it actually, un un it's uncertain because the Sukta, what it basically says is that maybe God didn't even know when the universe was created. I mean, nobody really knows, how can you know? So this is the type of culture we are, is that we're always questioning things because we're always seeking. So in our culture, there is no true belief. It's always about seeking and finding the truth and going forward and going forward. So the concept of our time really starts way back in history, whenever that is, we don't even know. And one of the proofs of this, again, is in our writings, in, in, in some of our Vedas, there's a concept called Hiranya Garbha. Hiranya Garbha is referred to as the cosmic egg, okay? The cosmic egg is described back long, long time ago. Now we're talking five, 7,000 years ago, I have no idea. Because another Western concept that I try to keep in mind is a lot of it has to be documented in writing. However, our culture has been an oral tradition for a very, very long time. So it's very hard to pin down the true history of when things started and how things propagated because it's been orally passed down from generation to generation. There are scores of people that can recite hundreds of thousands of hymns without missing a beat. And they've been doing this since the concept of this has begun. So I want you to keep that in mind is that all we know today is the documented history, but undocumented, I have no idea, all right? But the concept is something called the Hiranya Garbha, which essentially is the cosmic egg. It expands and contracts and expands and contracts and one time the expansion force basically burst open. And that's when, that's when it's described as the beginning of life in general or some kind of a cosmic event. If you compare that with the Big Bang Theory, it's pretty much similar in concept. I'm by no means saying that we've discovered or we've described Big Bang Theory, but the, the deep profound thinking that went into realizing that without any true instruments or super collider and CERN, it's amazing to think about is that that is proof enough to me that with deep concentration, deep meditation, deep breathing, and accepting life as it is can reveal truths that we have no idea about. And that's what we're losing in modern life every single day, okay? So the concept of time again, we think about minutes, we think about seconds, but if you look at this, our concept of time, the life of Buddha, is trillions of, um, Brahma, I'm sorry, is trillions of years. So you have to sit back and think about it and say, you know, how does a civilization even speak about this? How does that thought even come to mind to say confidently that this is my concept of time, this is five, seven, 10,000 years ago? How does, how does a person even comprehend that? You know, and then this, this is proof enough again to show the historical perspective of our, our, our culture is that the only way people have time to sit down and think about these profound thoughts is if it's a civilized society already. If you're a hunter and gatherer society, you're always trying to survive, trying to find food. But if you're sitting in deep meditation and concentrating, you have to assume that there is some kind of order in society. There's some kind of realization in society. There's some kind of maturity in society that there's people who can sit like that and really understand the depth of what life really means. So that's another concept I want you guys to understand is because history as described in modern world is that, well, you know, this is what happened, that's what happened, but most of the time they're fighting, you know, they, they didn't have time to do anything. But if you want to sit and think of these and actually write hymns and poems and and in what we call slokas and suktas, you have to have the time where the organized society supports you. Organized society takes care of you so that you can do these things and, and teach it to others. So that's proof, again, because a lot of times people ask for evidence. I mean, that's evidence. Just the existence of these books and these slokas and suktas is evidence in and of itself. And the concept, again, is Brahma. The one, one daytime of Brahma is described as 4.3 billion years. And when he closes his eyes, the night time for him is 4.3 billion years. That's the scale of time that Hinduism talks about, the Sanatana Dharma talks about. This is Mark Twain. Who doesn't know Mark Twain in the world? Mark Twain was a huge fan of Hinduism. He's, he writes, 
India is the cradle of human race, the birthplace of human speech, the mother of history, the grandmother of legend, and the great grandmother of tradition. Our most valuable and most instructive materials in the history of man are treasured up in India only. So there's a theory right now going about called out of India theory, which means that since it was a sacred land, many things that happened have dispersed across the globe and spread across the globe because of the uniqueness of that, of that sacred land that India, uh, India is. So this mandir, this temple, we call it a mandir, temple, you know, similar interchangeable words, is a very important place because, you know, uh, this is like the epicenter of the community just like maybe a church would be or whatever would be. This is the epicenter of the society, of the community where many things happen. People get together, you do rituals, you bond, you share, you pray, you do lots of things. And so you can see how profoundly the architecture has been carved in stone. So when a community really cares about their history and culture and their faith and everything else, you take time to make sure it has character to it. You can imagine that is a stone carved temple and look at the detail on those, on those because that is the degree of detail that was given to all of these things. Because everything about life was geared towards life, towards that realization of the truth, towards the realization of Satichanam, you know? Uh, so everybody took time with every action, every duty, everything that was done in life outside, inside the family, was about that truth and therefore it is okay to have such events in a mandir like this because this is what the community is all about. This is what we should be talking about. This is where we should be gathering and educating people. There should be no separation of church and state in this case because we're not really doing any politics. We're basically organizing as a community to make sure the community is a good place, that everybody learns the right values, everybody teaches the right things. And there's no politics here. It's just about appreciating your culture and propagating it across because that's where everything should flow from. That's where everything should stem from. So this is Nikola Tesla. So I'm a big fan. Uh, I, I, I haven't driven anything but a Tesla for the last 10 years because I'm such a big fan because I'm a sci science guy. But Nikola Tesla said, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. For our esteemed guests, I want you to realize that I hope I'm getting across at least very, in a very early way that there are no prophets in our, in our culture. There's only truth, there's only science. So this faith is truly a scientific religion if I were to say it myself because it's all about energy. Because this mandir itself, okay, it's not just a concrete building. This is consecrated building because there's a source of energy here. There's a source of pride here. There's a source of meaning here. It's not just a couple of walls where you just get together because everything that's here is carefully thought through, where it's positioned, where it's placed, how it looks, every single thing has a meaning. Every single aspect of this mandir has a meaning. And this is, you multiply that across the whole globe and across Bharat and across India, you can imagine the glory that goes into constructing just a simple mandir. So sounds and vibrations and frequency and energy and Sanskrit. So. I told you guys about uh, the birth, birth of life or the universe or whatever with the Hiranyagarbha or the cosmic egg or the Big Bang. That is nothing but sources of energy, essentially. That's what was realized is that life is about energy. Life is about transmitting this energy and being part of this energy source. And therefore you can see the, the deep respect to understand the sounds, the sounds of the mantras, the sounds of the om, the sounds of the chanting, the sounds of the hymns, the rhythmic nature of it. It's all to be part and feel that energy within you, within the mandir, with everybody around you. So that's why our shlokas that you heard just now, our, our mantras, are so specifically uh, said in a very specific way because the goal is not just to recite it blindly or just without, uh, without concentration, it's to actually feel the vibration. It's actually feel that, that energy that comes out of reverberating because your entire body pulsates to that energy. And therefore, Sanskrit is such a profound language because Sanskrit has 4,000 grammatical rules. 4,000 grammatical rules, okay? 
That is because there was such an emphasis placed on making sure every single you know, consonant, vowel, whatever you want to say is pronounced exactly the right way, exactly the right time, and it's done in groups so that that energy pulsations, you can feel it. And you know, so you'll, you'll hear this all over our mandirs. So I'm tying it back to science. That's why I call it a scientific religion. So symbolism. So I think you guys must have heard a little bit of symbolism that Dr. Chandrasekhar probably told you guys about. But every deity, every devata, every bhagwan, every, every god, whatever you want to call, is a manifestation of some symbolism of this life and this energy source. And if you look at this, this is from the famous Mahabharata. Okay, Mahabharata is one of our, what we call itihasa. Itihasa is a term in Sanskrit which means as it happened. So it's not a mythology. It is actually historical called as it happened. That's the literal meaning of itihasa. So in that, which is also poetic in the way it's written, all shlokas, and I don't know how many, but I forget there must be hundreds of thousands of shlokas there, I'm not really sure. But there are five horses. There are five horses. Five horses represent the five senses that humans have. Taste, smell, etc. The reins of that represent control of those senses. Bhagwan Sri Krishna is the one that is trying to be the atma of, of that living, living embodiment. Arjuna, who is the, who is the passenger, essentially is the soul or, or, or the jiva, we call it, of this, of this, and the chariot represents the body. Okay, so every single aspect of everything in Sanatana Dharma has a deep, deep and profound meaning, and I am a father of three children. I didn't even know this until recently where I've truly embedded myself as I'm in residency and really learning this and reading and reading and reading because I want to know this because I cannot find anything in all my life that is as profound as Sanatana Dharma is and it is our duty to make sure we're proud of it, that we protect it and that we propagate it. So some more mandirs. I already told you it's the epicenter. You know, many of you probably think of the Taj Mahal, right? Taj Mahal will not hold a candle to this architecture will not hold a candle to this type of architecture. This is what we should be celebrating. If anybody thinks of Bharat and India, this is what they should be thinking about. So this is another important aspect. This is especially for Dr. Vinod Patel because this is so dear and near to him, is that this mandir or many mandirs that are built represent actually the human body. All right? The, the layout of the way the mandir is actually constructed is laid out as the human body. For example, the head is where the main deity sits. The feet represent the entrance called the gopuram. So I, we can spend a lot of time just going through this whole thing. My daughter just took a course on temples recently because even the construction of it is exactly laid out the way it should be. So the, the, the cultural aspects of this is remembrance. Everything you do in life has to remind you and take you back to that, that, that connection to life that connection to the deep meaning, the profound nature of this culture. So I wanted to show our guests how Sanskrit looks. You can see that right there. Another beautiful thing about Sanskrit is that you could write in two lines what you could probably say in two paragraphs or an entire page in other languages because it is so rich in meaning and each verse or each shloka or each sukta can be interpreted in so many ways, it's, it's really unbelievable. So that is the Rig Veda, that's in, I think, the British Museum. I don't know why it's there, it should be in Bharat. I don't know why, why it is in England, I have no idea. Somebody can maybe, you know, explain that to our community. Uh, but I want to also share with you guys the, the body of literature, just for your reference. So if you look there on the left, there's four books called the Four Vedas. They are the Rig Veda, they're the Yajur Veda, they're the Sama Veda and Atharva Veda. And each of them had accompanying uh, commentaries about them, accompanying texts about them. And I want you to understand that Rig Veda talks about the cosmic universal aspects of our culture. The Yajur Veda talks about the procedural aspects of our culture. The Sama Veda talks about the, all the art and music aspects of our culture. And then the Atharva Veda talks about general life, you know, normal day-to-day -day kind of materialistic life. 
and you can see there's Dhanurvedam on the far right. It's about archery and it's about, it's about how to protect the culture. So I, again, I want to impress not only upon the guests, but our own culture and our own kids that I want you to think about, right? How does a culture sit? How does a community organize itself to sit and think about this vast body of knowledge and actually document it systematically across a unifying theme? So that is the Dhanurveda. Artha Shastra is another, another discipline. Ayurveda is another discipline all about health and medicine. So you can see that everything is about life. If I were to represent all of this, this is really understanding life itself. That's what Sanatana Dharma really means. It's about deep, deep probing of what does life actually mean? Where do we come from? What does it actually mean? What are we here for? What is our purpose? And that answers are not already available, really. That's why Sanatana Dharma is about seeking. We really believe this. To our heart, all the people that know this really well, is that even if this entire world were to explode, a nuclear catastrophe happens, there's one person left. Because this is eternal truth, that person can realize all these truths on their own if they spend the time to learn it. So there's no need for us to have a prophet in that sense for a community because every single one of you is capable of realization, realizing that. It just requires the discipline to realize it. So all of you here are potential to be a God. That is a big difference between other faiths and our faith. Each one of us can realize this truth. It takes methodology and training to achieve that. And therefore, Sanatana Dharma is all about peace, right? If I feel in my heart, if I experience divinity within me, if I know that you have divinity within you, I would never want to harm it. There is no othering. There is no othering because it's all part of the same universal consciousness. So these are deep, profound thinking and thoughts that we have to really embrace, right? So Sanatana Dharma has been a very, very peaceful society that only spread wellness and, you know, goodness to all over the world. So the three itihasas that everybody should know about, uh, really Bhagavad Gita is not an itihasa, but it's part of the Mahabharata, but I just want to make sure that I give due credit there. Uh, those are, but that's, that's part of our vast, vast body of literature. So I want to talk about this for, for just a moment because, you know, India or Bharat has been an epicenter of intellectual thinking, okay? Intellectual thinking. You can see the breadth and scope of the map. The far left on the top left goes into Afghanistan. The far right goes into Southeast Asia. You can see in Kashmir at the top, Kashmir actually is named after a rishi named Kashyap. It's a Sanskrit name. That's where many people went to study because one of our deities that you saw, saw there is Ma Saraswati. Saraswati's other name is Sharada. That originates in Kashmir. It's a sacred, sacred Hindu land. It's been for millennia. So you can see the breadth of people. There's a, there's a, there's a, a realized being called Adi Shankaracharya. His picture is right there. He actually traveled from the southwest. You can see at the bottom left, it says Adi Shankara. He went all over the country in his early 20s and 30s and actually established air, you know, places of, of worship across to the north, east, south, and west. So it's been a contiguous land. So it's a civilizational culture. It's not a nation state as we know it today. I want you guys, I don't know how many of you know who are not into politics, but uh, who are into politics, but nation state concept originated from the Westfall Treaty in, in Europe back in the day. That is not what India or Bharat is about. India or Bharat is about a civilizational identity that spans across a very, very broad geographic region. It's a geographical identity because any culture really gives birth based on the surroundings, the, the temperature, the rivers, the, the agriculture, the soil, the birds, the fauna, the flora, all of those influence the cultural development and that's why it is unique into one place. You can't uni universalize that in the sense that it, cannot, it could not have been born elsewhere. Just like American experiment could only happen here, it could not happen elsewhere. Similarly, this type of culture can only be born in a place like that because it is interacting with the environment. So education, the next concept, right? It's an intellectual place. Education was deeply embedded everywhere. You could see 
that is called a gurukula system. Gurukula system is there is one guru. There's a difference between you know a teacher and a guru. A teacher just simply imparts knowledge to you of a subject matter. A guru is really like a life coach. Okay, the guru actually takes you upon takes upon the duty to nurture young kids to make sure they become the most profound human being that that person is capable of being again, which is to realize that universal consciousness called Satichana, Satichana, I kind of can't say that properly, I'm sorry, but uh, it is to make sure that every human reaches that potential because every human has that potential. So that is where the, the shikshas or the, or the kids sit, you know, uh, in reverence below the teacher. The guru imparts the knowledge and they embed themselves in nature. You could see it's actually in nature. It's not in a classroom because they're encouraged to go outside, to interact with nature, to interact with animals, to interact with everything and have quiet time and do all the practices that have to be done. That is again a picture on the top right. All those dots with the names in the map of uh, Bharat show uh, essentially all the universities that existed back. So nowadays, everybody wants to come to the U.S. because it's such a wonderful place to learn. Everybody comes here to Stanford, to Harvard, etc. But back in the day, that's where everybody went because of the universities. This, all of this has been destroyed due to invasions. And hopefully, it's, you know, there's going to be a huge resurgence with us waking up and supporting these causes. But there existed hundreds and hundreds of very big universities with dormitories, with, with subject matter expertise, where people from China, Japan, you know, uh, Middle East, Everywhere, Europe, they came to study and learn. And one of the most famous ones that people know about is called Nalanda. Nalanda University, we just heard uh, Shinto Abe passed away. He actually came to India and he started a movement to revive that university and he was the first one to encourage it. And therefore, uh, you know, I know that, you know, there's Japanese uh, folks that know about this. I know that Chinese folks know about this and he recently came, you know, due respect to him for his passing away, but he was the one that wanted to revive the Nalanda University because there's a lot of Hindu influence in, in Japan as well. So this is the trade route. This is the trade route of how knowledge spread across the globe back in the day. India is in a very unique place where you can almost imagine it's carrying the world on top of it. If you really look at it, it looks like it's carrying the world on top of its shoulders. And geographically, it's surrounded by water everywhere. It's called the Hindu Sagar, Himalayas on the top. So it was a very protected area as well. And climatically, agriculturally, environmentally, it was a very, very unique place because it's extraordinarily diverse amounts of things that could have happened in that land. It was not, there was deserts there, there's rainforest there, there's all kinds of geography there. And people came across the oceans and, and spread. Therefore, the knowledge also spread across the globe, not just trade. And as an example, the far right here, you can see, that's called the Angkor Wat Temple in Cambodia. That's not in India. That's in Cambodia in the Southeast Asia. That is the world's largest mandir, sim I mean, similar to this, but it's a temple built in Cambodia. It still exists today. I did not know this two years ago. Shame, shame on me. So Afghanistan, there's still relics of Hinduism in Afghanistan. That's Indonesia in the far top left. So it spread wide across the entire globe. And a unique thing about this is it was not due to invasions. It was not due to conquest. It was not due to pillaging and rioting. It was because of the sacredness of knowledge that spread across. That's what propagated Sanatana Dharma culture across the globe which is something that we all should celebrate and be proud of. It was not taking battalions of forces and killing people. It was truly enlightening people and giving them the knowledge and the know-how how to embrace life. So mathematics originated, calculus, the number zero, pi, algebra, all of these things originated in India. It spread across from India to the Middle East, translated into Arab, Arabic, during the time of the golden age of Islam, and where in Baghdad there was a lot of patronage of this, it was translated, and from there it went to Europe, translated into Latin, and that's how it spread. And this is documented history. So this is an interesting uh, 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 chart I want to uh, share with you guys, because I'm gonna talk about a, a very modern concept that we're dealing with in, in the United States, unfortunately, and also in, in India today. So that is the representation of GDP 
as percentage of world GDP from one, one century, the first century, current era, all the way to 2003. This was conducted by Angus Madison, a historical econo economist, which is an accepted, accepted, validated research in the sense of validating it by other intellectuals. If you notice, India, the GDP contributed on the top left almost 33% of world GDP. 33% of the world's GDP. Through invasions that started in 700, 600 uh, CE, you can see the steady decline of what happened to the glorious culture. It is, it is, it, it pains my heart to see this chart because I look at this every other day. It tears me up to see the glory that we were and what we've become. You can see China and you can see how things have changed and you can see a rapid decline since the British invasion that happened in India. This is something that should wake every, every, everybody up to see this is where we stood. And one of the things I got to realize from this is that a society's organization is important. A community's organizational structure is very important because if you embrace the life that the ancients did, you could become that, which is materialism, which is what modernity is all about. If that's what you really care about, if that's all you care about, you should still embrace it because that's the proof right there. So one thing here I want to tie into modern society is caste, right? There's a big, big discussion about caste in America and in India. So caste is not something that was originally Indian at all. We have what we call varnas and jatis. Varnas are the capacities or the capabilities of a human being, okay? So the Brahma, Brahmins, are the ones that are intellectual in nature. The Kshatriyas are the warriors, the, the Vaishyas are the business commercial folks, and the Shudras are the people that are everyday folks. That's how a society is organized, and I, I dare anybody here to tell me, how is a corporation organized? How is a modern capitalistic corporation organized? It's organized exactly the same way. You have the board of directors, which is the intellectual brain house or the think tank of this organization. Then you have the executive management team, which is essentially the structure that's trying to make sure everything runs well and is protected. Then you have the Vaishyas, who are all the salespeople, commerce people, finance people that are making sure that the, the business is actually earning money. Then you have the day-to-day -day workers that are the call center folks that are actually doing the real work, that are the Shudras. That is how a modern capitalistic corporation actually works. So I don't understand how we got off track at all to make, make, make this structure something bad. So many of you probably know, some of you may not know, caste is actually a Portuguese word. It's not even a Hindu or Indian word at all. And how blind does a society have to be to not realize that this has nothing to do with us at all? I already showed you the contiguity of our motherland where everything was connected, interconnected. It was a civilizational culture. How did we forget this very basic aspect? We can discuss this in Q&A if you guys would like because I have some thoughts around it, but I just want to make sure about the caste. So that is not caste. That is the organization of a human. The Brahman, you could be a Brahman when you're intellectual thinking about it. You could yourself be a Kshatriya because you're protecting your family. You could be a, a Vaishya because you're earning money to kind of take care of your family. You could be a Shudra because you're tilling your soil in the back to garden. We could be every one of those characteristics. And Jatis basically are the trade skills that we have. You know, a singer may have, may project, you know, kind of create many singers. Uh, uh, textile folk may generate many textile, you know, kind of family legacy kind of thing. That, those are jatis that have nothing to do with caste at all. So another aspect, right, yoga and mind sciences. You know, I, I, I'm a plastic surgeon by trade. I, I, I'm in beauty, basically, because that's what I do. And I see many people coming as I'm going to yoga. I need to look good in my clothes and stuff like that. And I just kind of internally laugh at it a little bit. Uh, because I just kind of find the absurdity in it because yoga has absolutely nothing to do with stretches at all. Every aspect, again, of yoga is to prepare your body and your mind to realize that ultimate consciousness. All the stretches that you see happening is to create an awareness that you could sit quietly without any bodily disturbances for hours on end so that you realize that deep profoundness that the rishis realized back in the day. So the stretches, while they give you physical benefits, the real purpose of it is to be able to sit down quietly without disturbance, without pain, without aching, and be happy within yourself. Again, culturally speaking, think of a community of people that are that kind of a community. How would you ever have violence in that community? 
Why would you need violence in that community? Why would you need rights in that community? It's all about duties because they all flow from that kind of a human potential and realization. And those are first principle thinking that India did, that Bharat did, that Hindus did. First principle thinking. First, let's be real to life. What does life actually mean? Let me realize that truth. So Patanjali is a Rishi back in the day up in the north, northwest, you know, near Kashmir area, who was the one that codified the, the, the teachings or the methodologies of yoga called Yoga Sutra. But I also showed you the, the chariot where Sri Krishna that uh, revealed the, tr you know, revealed some teachings basically to Arjuna who was questioning whatever he was. He also spoke about yoga in that, in that time period as well. And that was dated to 5,500 BCE, that's 7,000 years ago at least that we know of. So even yoga has many features to it. I'd love to speak about it another, moment, another, uh, another time, but uh, uh, the, I wanted to make sure that I emphasize that yoga is about union, union with that universal consciousness. It's not really just stretching. And you can see everything is gonna gear towards realizing that human potential, which is immense to make sure that your divinity there. You start and you, you know, go all the way up to the top as intellectual and realize that uh, that you are part of this consciousness, this nature, this universe, and that's what everything hin uh, Hinduism is about. So religion and science can and do coexist. I spoke about energy sources, I spoke about co uh, consecration, but yoga, because it's not enough for me just to say, just trust, uh, trust the, you know, the whoever told you. You have to realize it yourself. You have to have that experience within you, and yoga is a methodology that is, those are the tools that enable you to realize that yourself. So I want you to understand the profound nature of this culture again is that not only did it tell you, it says this is what you have to do to realize it yourself because don't believe me, don't trust me, you do it yourself. But what are we doing in modern society today? We are going further and further away because we are extracting ourselves from the nature that we are part of and trying to isolate us in our cocoon where we have air conditioning, where we have you know, gadgets. Who the hell needs an uh, app to meditate? Why do you need an app to meditate? You just close your eyes. This is what absurd society we're building. So science and religion can coexist. You know, this is CERN in Switzerland. I don't know how many of you know, but some of the scientists here probably know. This is where the super collider is, where they're trying to recreate the Big Bang. If you walk there in the front, that is Nataraja, who is Shiva, doing the cosmic dance. Why would the world's most deeply thinking physicist put up a figure of Nataraj in front of that super collider in CERN, Switzerland? Because the concepts that were thought through in the civilization inspired many of these physicists. It was the inspiration for them. Oppenheimer, who was the one that created the atom bomb, when that exploded, he recited the verse of Bhagavad Gita. It was inspiration. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, I already told you Mark Twain, all of the deep intellectual physicists, you know, poets, writers, got inspiration from the Vedas, from the Upanishads and those kind of uh, the thinking, the concepts. So the meaning science, again, I can skip through this quickly because we don't have time, but even the number of times you recite a mantra has a scientific background to it. The number is 108. 108 is because of the distances that were somehow figured out without any instruments, what the distance is from the earth to the sun, how, what the diameter of the sun is, etc. that were discovered through realization of these truths and that's what we use. So even the number of times we recite something has profound meaning to it. So health and medicine. This is a moment of great pride for me because plastic surgery is what I do and the first plastic surgeon on the planet was a guy named Shashruta, who was the first one that did nasal surgery to you know, repair some problems of the nose back long, 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 long time ago. So the birthplace of surgery is there. Birthplace of plastic surgery is there in India, Shashruta. Many of us in medicine take the Hippocratic Oath. There was another oath called the Charaka Oath. There was another medical guy named Charaka who also had an oath that was compulsory for people to recite before they accepted this very sacred, you know, healing uh, mechanism. So pranayam and, you know, breathing. So I want you to first focus on the top right. This is in the Scientific American Journal. This proper breathing brings better health. 
This is very recent article just a few months ago, and you can see the bottom right there breathing in a certain way. If you look at the top left, that's an ancient depiction of the exact same technique on the top left. So it is a unique thing again for me, if you're really focused on the truth, is that why is it that when it's in a modern scientific journal, suddenly it becomes acceptable for everybody, even for us Indians? I don't understand it. This has been revealed thousands of years ago. You can see, you know, young folks, old folks, you know, you know, saints, priests, everybody doing it because modern science have now shown that these breathing techniques, these yoga techniques actually have profound influence on health. So diversity, inquiry, questioning, reason, logic, and seeking, it's a very scientific religion. Sanatana Dharma is a very scientific religion. So <clears throat> in medicine, I want to just make one point because uh, I at least have the credibility to say so. You know, my, a lot of Western medicine, I think, gets it wrong. A lot of Western medicine, Western thinking is about reductive thinking. Essentially, you take an organism like a human and you break it up into as many little components as possible and you study the effects of that one broken up part to see what influence the environment has around it. Take cholesterol, for example. I don't mean to insult any cardiologists here at all, but it probably has profound impact. very isolated scenario by correlating it with number of heart attacks or whatever, but we don't know the myriad and millions of billions of other interactions that happen in the body that lead to a person's health a certain way, right? So it's very reductive. However, the medicine that was realized in, in ancient India was holistic in nature from day one. Now we talk about precision medicine, customized medicine. That's basically what Ayurveda thinking is, is that how, what is the quality of, the, of you? How do you realize the quality? How do I make sure that whatever medication I give you is suited to that particular personality. So it's a very pluralistic society. If you have this kind of a community, you can give birth to many thinkings and these are actually well accepted. They're not, they're not, they're not, they're, they're not killed, they're not chastised, they're actually celebrated. And so four major religions were born in India, Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, and Sikhism, and they live in harmony. Again, pluralistic society only can happen. In 2002, a Muslim was the president. In 2017, what modern society calls, unfortunately, a Dalit is the president. The next one that's being nominated is a tribal. So only in India can something like this happen. Think of all the other countries in the world where something like this has happened or not happened so far. So women's rights, modern concept. So I want you to focus on the far right, top right. It's called the Ardha Narishwara. Ardha means half, Narishwara means that female, etc. right? So the, the universe is born with the confluence of the male and the female, not male alone. Role of women, like I told you, when there was a, when there was a disagreement, it was done through debate. This is a very famous folklore of Adi Shankara debating with somebody, but the judge is a female. This is back in the ancient days. Structure, respect, and tradition. You can see the president of the United, uh, president of India, is touching the feet of somebody is awarding something too. That's respect, not from position, but from wisdom. So nature is very much part of what we what we are about. I'm trying to rush through this. I apologize. There's so much I want to say, but I have to rush through. But it's all about nature. You know, uh, celebrating fire, water, earth, and this is in the modern world called pagan religion. Maybe as you know, many young people may relate to. But this is realizing life. Animal rights. You know, you heard about vegetarianism. You know, respecting all life because we are not put on this earth to pillage this earth. We're, we're put on this earth to be in coexistence with everything around us. So everything has life in it. Everything deserves the respect, not just us. So for me personally, Hinduism is like a giving tree. You know, giving tree is a tree that has deep roots in the ground. A kid comes and he takes a fruit when he's young. He swings or she swings on the branches. You know, it gives shade. It's, it's doing all of this, but unfortunately, the depiction of this is that that kid has destroyed by taking and taking and taking and not giving it back. So Hinduism to me represents that, is that we take from the profound thinking of thousands of years, but we are not supporting the roots to make sure it grows properly again. That to me is the status of Hinduism today. So it's a churn, okay? This is, this is, this is the churn that we talk about uh, where the, the gods and the, and the demons are churning the waters 
and trying to get things out of it, you know, that pop out of it like, you know, nectar and, you know, all that. And so the, the India is going through a resurgence because it's been pillaged and raped for so long that we're trying to figure out our identity yet over again, discovering all these things. So there's a lot of churn going on in society. So India is much more than British occupation. Those are all the empires that were part of India that nobody talks about or nobody knows, should, nobody knows about but should know. So there's a continuity, civilizational contu continuity of India. So I want, this is an important slide. If you see Christianity, Islam is everywhere, but that little small green spot, you know, in, in the center there, that is the only land that Hindus have. We have to protect and preserve it. That is all we have. So what does Bharat represent? Continuous, organically evolved civilization. It's really a living experiment. So I don't want to go into this because this is more commentary than anything. Uh, but uh, so we believe we have some solutions. If it's relevant today than any other day, Hinduism, Sanatana Dharma is relevance today. This is something we can really propagate across to start, you know, help decrease violence, be calm, sit down and be, you know, kind of comfortable in yourself, you know, kind of just embrace life and learn about nature. So quickly, we stand for these, uh, these things as a PAC, Political Action Committee. These are the things that we want to focus on, accuracy of textbooks and education, general education and knowledge about Hinduism, fight Hindu phobia. There should be no Hindu phobia, there should be no Islamophobia, there should be religious phobia, there should be none of that. Kashmir, caste, and swastika. So misrepresentation media, I don't have time to go over it, but I want you to understand this because for the elected officials, swastika is an extremely sacred symbol for many, many faiths, including Sanatana Dharma and, and Hinduism. You can see a, a dancer in that pose. This is thousands of years old. There is no such thing as a good swastika or a bad swastika. It is just auspicious swastika, and that's it, end of story. And these are all the, all the great intellectuals that were born, and uh, I'm just going to run through this really quickly. So you can really sum it up in this. Aham Brahmasmi. I relate not just to me, but with the nature, but with the universe as a whole. Tat Tvam Asi, which essentially means that whatever is looking, whatever you're looking for outside of you, it's already inside of you. Whatever it is that you're seeking outside of you is already inside of you. So uh, dharma, karma, satyam, these are all things I could have spent more time on, but I'm going to rush through it in the interest of time. And I was going to have you guys listen to something that you can feel the vibrations because I listen to this every day. It makes, it starts my day in a very, very good way. But thank you all. Pranam. Danyavad.
to school here every weekend and they'll learn. But this is now a bit more of a higher level organization. So the concept that we're trying to accomplish here is that Hindu civilization is up here, right? Everything else, all local organizations are below that in a sense of preserving the civilization. If you, have, if you don't have that, you have nothing. So we are now organizing around that concept and we plan to do this once a month across the community because we are part of America, we're part of this culture. We have to spread this across the local community. So we are going to do this once a month, every month. The next month is going to be the municipal leadership that we did. About two weeks ago, we did the school board candidates and some commissioners and such. And so we plan on doing this, and this actually be broadcast out of the country because other parts of the country also want to replicate this model where mandirs and all of us combine forces and do it together because we're trying to unite everybody. Yes, sir. Yeah, but following up, can you send a file, YouTube, or something else to Christmas here or to? So you know, I'm very proud today because <laughs> two young kids are actually live streaming it right now. You can see that's what they've been doing. So it's going to be stored in eternity, hopefully our YouTube unless some catastrophe happens to the server farm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a question, but I just wanted to kind of thank you all. Being that I'm an educator and I've been an educator for the last 28 years is so knowledgeable and I always believe that people know better when they do better. And so the information that you all have shared here with us this morning was very enlightening and it just really opened up your mind to a whole lot. So I appreciate it. I think that that's whoever decided that this was something that they need to move towards. It was a great thought, and I hope that you all continue to do that. That is one of the causes we put up there called Hinduphobia, but in this venue, uh, I think we'll defer that for, no, for now, but I would encourage you guys to look us up on the pack. This is exactly what we're trying to do, so you should have all gotten an individual card. There's a QR code. If you go there, give us your contact information. We'll invite you to our meetings because there's a big nationwide movement happening to combat exactly this with partnership with our local leadership.
really appreciate it. I, I always say we always learn something. And I'm one of the person the student, I always learn something new. Today I learned quite a bit something very new. And this not by every outsiders, but even us Hindus, we learn quite a bit. So once again, thank you from a bottom heart of the thank you to you. Really appreciate it. And once again, I can say thanks to our honorary guests from Aramahat and on behalf of Chapel, I want to thank you for being with us today and we really appreciate it. And anytime you're passing by, come on in, anytime. Temple's open seven days a week, morning from 10 to 12 and the evening from 7 to 9. You're all around the whole time. And we, we already thanked the sponsor Jennifer and Harish Alpani and all our volunteers, all our savers, you guys did a good job with all your students, and especially Sadhvi, you did a great job. I'm proud of you and proud of all your students. Continue, please. And now I'm going to ask our uh, uh, to the give presentation. Also, I want to thank our temple volunteers. We have Bhavya volunteers, and then we have temple volunteers. It's 10 o'clock. I want to thank all of you for being here supporting us. Thank you. Can we invite the uh, esteemed guest, Felicia Davidson, Patricia Williams, uh, Robert Bartleway, and Bernardo staff member, Anika Mokrim staff member. Thank you. So this uh, book is about, can you see the book? It's a Hindu culture and our Dharmic traditions of India. They have 32 pages and they have 32 posters who can be displayed anywhere, if you like, in the libraries and schools, museums, even in the Capitol Hill. We like to do this project with this uh, uh, exhibition. Thank you.
Dr. Vinod Patel, Dr. Chandrasekhar, Dr. Pirish Agarwal, they are our board of advisors, keep us in straight line. And did anybody miss it? Yes, you missed Shekhar Reddy. Oh. A man who was in charge of all this. He always makes it happen. Sorry, uh, we took a little bit longer than we said the problem. But it was time. very interesting. Thank you. So I appreciate Hurry it. Up. First of all, thanks to all the delegates from part of our government, those who are working for this county and state. And also, this is the union, community, actually. Oh, sorry, I missed the have all my... here. Believer in faith. We are coming, getting to together. And also, we are blessing the half of our temple and our community people, all the delegates, which is the aims and goals they are under this position. We are truly heartily blessing you all to achieve all your goals in the upcoming years. Bring the rightful future for the humanity. We are here to witnessing with our holy hands of, from the Vedas. We are blessing you all. Please enjoy. Hari Om. Lead me from dark 
darkness to light, ignorance to enlightenment. Lead me from death to immortality. May all the people and all the places experience joyousness. May there be peace within our body, may there be peace within our mind, and may there be peace within our soul.